Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome back to the afternoon session of uh, uh, the Augmented Reality course. And there we were informed by the registration desk that uh, apparently a part of the registered attendees of this course have received their copy of the book which was included in the package and some have not. Um, so, uh, there, and the reason is that not enough books were shipped, something like that. Um, so it's, this is not my control and that more should be arriving this afternoon and please inquire with the front desk and if things really go wrong then email uh, to this address uh, to claim your, your book which is part of your course package. Um, I'm sorry about that but I'm, logistics apparently are in the age of augmented reality still a very complicated uh, thing. Um, good. Um, so here's the revised schedule of what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, I will be covering two topics. Uh, first, tracking, um, and then I will be talking about rendering, about uh, graphics generation. And uh, then we'll have a short coffee break and then Mark Billinghurst will be joining us for the final segment where uh, we will cover interaction and also outline some future directions. Uh, engage in some wild speculation. Yes, so tracking. So you've, you've learned about, uh, you know, application domains and you've learned about the output side, namely displays. So clearly we also need to cover the input side of an interactive system and that uh, would be tracking. And uh, I'll try to do that in a rapid succession within one hour by starting with some fundamentals, uh, so tracking, calibration, registration, and uh, characteristics of, of measurement systems, and then discuss specific technologies for tracking, for sensing, uh, also using optical sensors, and then we'll cover some advanced topics. Let's see how far we can get, in particular outdoor tracking and uh, sensor fusion topics. Um, so first of all, uh, a clarification of some of the terminology because that's very confusing when you read this kind of material and in particular when you go into research literature and in particular when you go into research literature on computer vision or well robotics or other fields then uh, it gets very confusing and this is a kind of a, an attempt at a consistent definition of these three terms it's not necessarily the only one that is out there uh, so be careful a little bit. Uh, but a good way of uh, defining it is that you say we, in augmented reality, we are generally seeking a registration. And by registration, we mean the alignment of spatial properties. So this is when we can bring a virtual object and a real object or a real spatial location into the same you know, place in the user's perception. Um, and then there's, uh, there's two things going on. One is offline and one is online. And the calibration is the offline part. Calibration is the offline adjustment of measurements. And be careful, this doesn't uh, only include spatial measurements. Yeah, you can have spatial calibration um, and you can have non calibration of non-spatial parameters. Um, so for example, calibrating for room temperature or something like that. Huh? Um, and uh, calibration is something that is done offline. That doesn't mean it's done only one time. That could be that it happens uh, once in a lifetime in the factory or something, or you do it every time you start up the system. If you do it continuously, but the calibration, the, the, this uh, adjustment is not the main interest of the application, then sometimes it's called auto calibration. Huh? Um, and then finally we have the tracking, and uh, the tracking is just the dynamic sensing and measurement uh, of spatial properties. Yeah? So that means that dynamic registration, not static registration, dynamic registration is the result of successful tracking. And there's one more caveat that is if we are in the, in the field of AR or VR, then we always are talking about 3D. Yeah? 3D spatial tracking and not just 2D in screen space because in classic computer vision for automation, let's say for assembly lines, there's a lot of things that only happen in 3D. So that's not what we're doing here. 
Um, instead, we do it in 3D, and therefore we must establish three-dimensional coordinate systems, and there are a number of them. Uh, Tobias has already shown uh, these diagrams in the display section. Um, in general, we can say that we have some kind of I-coordinate system, which is often um, defined by a camera, if there is a camera in the system, if we're doing video-based augmentation, and then we have local object coordinates. Uh, and both of them are expressed relative to global world coordinates. The thing that binds them together is like, you know, the origin of whatever we have in the world. And then there's also perspective transformation. And you see, uh, well, the perspective transformation is, of course, uh, mapping the, um, the, the three-dimensional space into some kind of two-dimensional display space. And as a result, we have multiple coordinate systems to configure, and therefore we can track multiple coordinate systems, or we can assume some of them to be static, which means pre-calibrated. Uh, and this is exactly the two types of edges in the diagrams that Tobias has shown, where, which could either be dynamically varying and tracked, or uh, could be static and pre-calibrated. Um, okay, so now we know what we're trying to measure, and now we have to build a measurement system. And uh, there are many, many options to choose from, leading to a large number of possible spatial measurement systems. And I'll just try to give you a very, very quick rundown of, of these characteristics so you know what to look for, and then we'll look at some specific technologies that implement some selection of these characteristics. So the first question to ask is, what are we, measure, what are we measuring? Uh, are we measuring on a global scale or on a local scale? This is really a question of how big is the, 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 the measured area, the, 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 the working area. Um, and the related topic is, how is the reference defined? Do we have absolute references? Are they always going to be the same with respect to some predefined origin? Or are these relative measurements which only make sense when you know where you started the measurement process? Um, and then we have to choose, and this is maybe one of the most crucial aspects among a variety of physical phenomena. Uh, there's uh, variations of electromagnetic radiation that would include visible light, infrared light is very popular technology, coherent light, the laser, um, but also other forms of electromagnetic radiation, such as radio signals, magnetic fields. Um, and then in addition, there's other physical modalities, such as sound, gravity, or inertia, uh, that uh, can be used uh, as uh, sort of the physical enablers for, uh, for a measurement system. Then we can measure according to a number of principles. And there was a question just before lunch on, on exactly that we can uh, measure at least three different things. Um, so these are the sort of things of practical value. That would be the signal strengths, the signal direction, and also the time of flight of a signal. And depending on which you choose, you end up with very different sensors. And uh, these sensor configurations can then deliver any number of degrees of freedom, starting from just one degree of freedom. So I don't know if you have a slide rule that would be a one degree of freedom mechanical measurement contraption, if you want. Uh, in general, we're looking for six degrees of freedom, or six DOF, as uh, sometimes the jargon uh, goes. Uh, three degrees of freedom for position, uh, and three degrees of freedom for orientation. And uh, you can have systems that measure only a subset of these, but uh, for, full, for fully registered three-dimensional augmented reality, we ideally want to have uh, all six degrees of freedom. Um, and in order to deliver that, uh, there can be a variety of uh, sensor arrangements, starting with only a single sensor uh, that only delivers a single isolated measurement uh, to uh, a rigid array of sensors. And again, there can be two, uh, well, to extremes, let's put it like this. You can have a, a sparse sensor array uh, and you can have a dense array of sensors. So any kind of digital camera, for example, would be a dense sensor array packing approximately one million pixel measurements in a very tiny space. Now these, are, uh, these are intensity measurements. You're measuring light intensity and you're measuring it in a dense array of one million individual uh, sensors. Um, and uh, the, the final 
characteristic is whether the sources of the measurement are active. So for example, if you do acoustic measurements, you could have a loudspeaker to emit a sound pulse. Uh, or do you have passive sources where you, for example, are only relying on the reflection of natural light in the scene? Or do, or do you have not have any sources at all, uh, as for example with inertial measurements where you're measuring uh, uh, either velocity or acceleration and that doesn't really need a source, that just needs the motion itself as the source. Um, so you see, there's, there's many, many of these options. In addition, there's some more stuff, such as which geometric property are we measuring. If you are colloquial, typically people say we do triangulation, but there's actually two different types of uh, geometric approaches. Trilateration would measure three distances, um, and triangulation is actually when you know two angles and one distance, and depending on this, what kind of sensor you have, either of these two principles may, may be used, or even in combination. And uh, if you have multiple sensors, then these sensors can either be arranged in an outside-in or an inside-out fashion, depending on the direction in which the signal travels. So the object in the middle is always the mobile object that changes over time. Um, and uh, I've depicted this here with uh, light sources and cameras. Um, if you have the cameras mounted stationary in the environment, that allows you to deliver, just because of the geometric configuration, a rather good position, uh, but a rather poor orientation measurement, whereas if you do inside-out measurement, uh, then it's kind of the opposite. The additional difference between the outside-in and the inside-out principle is that if you use the inside-out principle in augmented reality, if you want to be mobile, if you want to be mobile user, uh, then uh, th an inside-out principle is more easily compatible with a mobile uh, approach because you're carrying all the technical infrastructure with you, whereas in the outside-in arrangement you must per definition always have a stationary part of the infrastructure which cannot always de de be deployed even if it is a, a, a passive part of the infrastructure. So for example in the 1990s and 2000s when I made experiments in my old school, uh, put up lots of fiducial markers on the walls, people were complaining about the visual pollution, and that was only passive infrastructure produced with a black and white laser printer, huh? uh, let alone putting many, many cameras in some kind of environment. Um, but of course, if you carry all the sensors, then you have a weight and economic issue, so uh, that is difficult as well. Um, let's move on to measurement error. If we have a measurement system, we also want to characterize what we're getting and how good the quality of the, of the measurements is. And there are really two um, different types of error, uh, namely accuracy and precision. So accuracy is an assessment of how close a measurement is to the true value. And this is something that is affected by systematic error, so you can basically combat it it, you can basically combat it with better uh, calibration. Whereas precision tells us how closely multiple measurements agree. So this is the, the error that is introduced in the form of, of, of noise into the system. And this will be a function of the type of sensor, may even vary with, with per degree of freedom. Um, and if you can obtain multiple measurements, you can average them, for example, or perform some more sophisticated form of filtering, uh, but that requires more computation and, as a result, also more latency, uh, in addition to a reduced frame rate or some, some sort of frame rate reduction. Um, so these are really two very different uh, types of error. The precision is definitely the one that is harder to, to control, and uh, in particular, you also have to uh, see this um, with respect to the resolution. So resolution is the minimum difference that can be discriminated by a given measurement system. And, and if your noise is much larger than your resolution, then the actual resolution doesn't help you very much. This is already a problem when you have, I don't know, a 15 megapixel uh, camera in your smartphone only for picture taking, not for tracking, not for optical tracking, then already you're getting 
with very small uh, CMOS sensors, you're already getting to the boundary where it doesn't make sense to increase the pixel resolution anymore because with the low amount of light that is going into the, into the phone cameras, the resolution is kind of pointless. You're just emphasizing the noise by adding more pixels and making the, the measurement, the, pixels, the, the measured pixels even smaller. Yeah? Um, and, and there's a lot of cheating going on with hardware vendors who quote enormous resolution numbers, but they're not talking about the precision that you can get out of it. Uh, so be careful there. Um, I already uh, said that uh, filtering is affecting the, the temporal characteristics, and this is also something that, of course, you have to look at because a spatial error is just, no, a, a temporal error is just as bad as a spatial error. If you get a measurement too late, for example, it's also in the wrong position with respect to the time when you're using it. So we want a high update rate. Update rate is the number of measurements per time interval. We want a low latency. Um, latency would be the time it takes from the occurrence of a physical event to something for the measurement. This is uh, the time when the data uh, becomes available. Uh, but much more interesting, if you're building an augmented reality application, is the so-called end-to-end latency, um, sometimes called motion to photons. Uh, that this is the time it takes from the occurrence of a physical event to the presentation of a stimulus, so for example, of a visual stimulus. Uh, and that is, of course, the, the aggregate of the measurement latency, system processing latency, and display latency. Uh, which can vary tremendously based on how clever you engineer your system and pipeline uh, your components together. Okay, so um, now you've heard a lot of theoretical terms and now we're going to put them into some practice using uh, some of the um, measurement systems. And I'm, I'm skipping over stationary measurement systems such as mechanical or acoustic systems because they're not very relevant for augmented reality, and I'll jump right into uh, sensors that are available for mobile use. And uh, this would start with the global positioning system. Uh, that is basically a planet scale, so a really truly global, the only truly global measurement system if you want, outside in, because you have the satellites orbiting the Earth and uh, emitting their, um, their payload signal um, using radio waves, uh, and measuring based on a time of flight principle. And uh, this is a very expensive infrastructure, obviously. GPS is actually the American variety, that you should call it a satellite navigation system because there's also Russian GLONASS and the Chinese one and the European Galileo is now finally starting. Um, what you need in order to do this time of flight measurement is, of course, a clock synchronization. The clock synchronization between uh, geospatial satellites and uh, a handheld receiver or whatever turns out to be actually the tricky part, then you can go on and do trilateration, not triangulation, from at least four satellites to get the robust piece of information. And typically this will deliver, well, it will deliver three degrees of freedom, like longitude, latitude, and height or elevation, but the elevation is most of the time ignored because it's also a poor, you know, the geometric conditioning for that is poor. Um, and uh, you could look up the height just by having a digital elevation map and uh, looking up the elevation from the map. Um, and in general, global positioning systems will not give you very good accuracy. This will be in the range of uh, tens of meters error, depending on the situation, also depending on what the perception conditions are. If you see enough satellites, if you're in an urban canyon or in some poor reception situation. Indoors doesn't work because there will be reflections of the signal and that is really like scrambling. Um, so uh, with, a, you know, with a smartphone, with a teeny tiny GPS uh, receiver, uh, that costs a few dollars, you cannot expect to get great uh, GPS accuracy. You can make GPS much more sophisticated, much more accurate by introducing differential GPS, where uh, we uh, take care of the fact that most of the measurement errors actually come from atmospheric distortions, that the uh, time of flight measurement principle depends on 
homogeneous, a homogeneous medium in which the signal travels, and that is just not given. Um, so we, what we can do is we can receive a correction signal from a base station um, propagated over a network side channel like, like uh, 4G or something like that. Um, so the base station knows its exact location and can compute the error to a local GPS reception, reception and then propagate that error signal uh, to, the, to the differential GPS receiver. So that makes it much more accurate. And in addition, once, you've lived, once you have uh, obtained that level of accuracy, um, you can also go into a real-time kinematics mode where you're exploiting not only the time of flight but also the signal phase of the satellite signal because then you have enough precision to actually make use of the, of the phase. Otherwise, you can't. Uh, and that can give you centimeter level accuracy just with GPS alone, but only in good reception characteristics, only if you see enough satellites, um, and only if you have a proper antenna. And by proper antenna, I mean an antenna of this size. Yeah? Uh, no, single fist size is probably not big enough. This is the kind of mushroom that you see when uh, professional surveyors work outdoors on a tripod on, on some kind of total station. Uh, so that's not going to make it into a mobile handset or a pair of, of VR or AR goggles anytime soon, which means that GPS alone will probably not be good, um, but it will be a starting point. I'll return to that later. Um, then there's a magnetometer, or uh, more commonly known as an electronic compass, that just measures the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. That's actually a three-dimensional magnetic field, um, typically using the Hall effect. Um, and uh, that uh, gives you sort of global orientation, if you want. You, most of the time, you're only interested in the, in the bearing, like the northing, where's north, where's south and not in the other two degrees of freedom, because you can estimate those relative to gravity. Um, but the magnetometer has a big drawback. It's very susceptible to uh, electromagnetic interference. And here you see an experiment um, that we did where we just uh, switched hands, and the, the person, the experimenter, was wearing a watch on the right-hand side. And you see uh, a jump of uh, over 10 degrees of arc uh, error just from the metallic watch. Yeah? So that tells you that the magnetometer alone is not very good. So now we're coming to the purely incremental sensors the, uh, uh, that work uh, on, on inertial measurements. And uh, you probably remember gyroscopes from your childhood. So there's also electronic gyros that are actually microelectromechanical systems measuring uh, the Coriolis force. Um, and that uh, gives us um, that gives us the velocity of well the rotational velocity, and then we can integrate that once, and so we obtain orientation. But of course, when you do numeric integration, there will be drift, which means gyroscope alone is not very stable. You could go for a laser gyro that is much much more stable. Unfortunately, they tend to cost tens of thousands of dollars, and they're only built into airplanes, and they're also a little big. So what you see here is, uh, I actually tried that out myself. Uh, I, I think it was in 2001. It's a, a laser gyro on, mounted on a helmet. It cost $100,000. And they handed the helmet to me and said, like, please don't break it. Um, yeah, so it, it had great orientation <laughs> tracking. <laughs> uh, there's also the, the uh, position equivalent to inertial measurement, the linear accelerometer that can be simply described as, as, as a mass on a spring. Uh, and you measure the displacement of the mass. Um, and that's it. That gives you one dimensional acceleration. Um, you stack three of them together in an autonomal, uh, orthogonal arrangement, and you end up with, a, uh, with acceleration in 3D that you can integrate twice, uh, thereby uh, increasing your, your measurement errors uh, the, the accumulated drift tremendously. But the actually difficult part is to subtract the gravity, because you, you know there's going to be a vector of almost uh, 10 newton, uh, 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 and, uh, and it's going to, but you don't know in which direction it actually points. So you have to do some filtering to get out the gravity, and then you end up with a fairly nice uh, 
um, measurement of, of position. Uh, and if you combine linear accelerometers, gyros, and compasses into a single device, then you can use their particular strengths and weaknesses uh, to, in a combined filter. Um, and that is then often called an inertial measurement unit. And this is a thing that you will typically now have in your smartphone, tablet, uh, and so on, also in all the headsets. Uh, but this is a high frequency measurement device for, uh, for tracking that is prone to drift. So you will need to combine it with something else. And the something else is now typically an optical sensor. Uh, so today, uh, digital optical sensors, digital cameras have become really, really powerful. Um, they're mostly based on, on CMOS uh, chip technology now. And uh, the, the really appealing part is that not only I get, is the hardware always, uh, always getting uh, you know, more powerful and more inexpensive, uh, but actually uh, we can defer a lot of the power of the system into the computer vision algorithms and uh, these follow Moore's law, obviously. Um, so we have a very good rate of improvement here. And in fact, the lenses are now becoming the most limited part if you're using miniature devices. Yeah? Uh, the types of lenses that we have in our smartphones and also built into the headsets now are not of the size and quality that a professional photographer or somebody interested in industrial optical systems would even consider. Yeah? But you cannot I mean, you cannot make a lens this size and then stick it onto a smartphone or something like that. So there's some problem there. But still, this is the, um, the strongest area of growth. And, um, and optical systems allow a lot of degree of freedom in design. Um, one has to do with the illumination. So I already said that it can be passive and active sources. Obviously, um, passive illumination would be natural light. Yeah? Uh, active illumination we can control, and often this is done by choosing the infrared spectrum. So you use an infrared light source that you strategically place, um, and then uh, you use an infrared filter on the camera, and that gives you a very high contrast input image to work with. Uh, by the way, I'm not uh, explaining too much about computer vision as such today, but you should be aware that all these tracking systems that use cameras typically use black and white cameras. Yeah? There's, uh, because if you, if you use a color camera, it will typically have a Bayer pattern that's already some filtering and averaging going on. Uh, and it's never color stable because the color very much depends on the, on the incident illumination as well. Uh, so uh, you only use grayscale images uh, for this matter. Or, infrared grayscale images, uh, such as, for example, on the Microsoft Kinect, which has a laser projector, Tobias mentioned it already uh, very quickly, uh, that projects a particular pattern, as you can see here in the middle, this is actually a picture from the infrared channel of the camera, uh, and then you can search this pattern and uh, compute depths by triangulating between the laser projector and the single camera. So this is the operating principle of the Microsoft Kinect version one. The Kinect for the Xbox one, the Kinect version two, is a time of flight sensor that you know, measures laser travel time directly. Um, both cases would be structured light. So that's more than active illumination where you're just making sure there's enough light in the scene and maybe light in a particular frequency spectrum. Um, the structured light is something where you shine a laser or you shine a pattern onto a surface. Um, also radar would be a, a variant of this principle or LIDAR, uh, sort of short range uh, uh, radar. Um, and uh, so with, with proper illumination, a lot can be done. And this is why most of these depth sensors, I mean, most of them are now time of flight, but they would fall into this, this category and all the uh, contemporary devices like the HoloLens or the Google Tango or the, the Meta have, have depth sensors on board uh, because then you get a, a three-dimensional measurement directly. Um, if not, if you want to use visual light, 
there's also a large variety of, of principles that work there. In particular, when you go to completely unconstrained environments, where you cannot be sure that your, uh, let's say, infrared illumination will actually work, then you want to work with visible light and with, uh, with whatever is, is uh, somehow visible in the environment. And there have been two primary design directions, fiducial markers uh, or, or uh, uh, artificial markers and natural feature tracking. So the, the distinction is a little blurry, but in general, fiducial markers are something that you intentionally put there to be able to track it. Yeah, it's kind of a reference that you place somewhere. Whereas in natural feature tracking, you try to work with whatever is already available in the environment. So that's kind of uh, the opposite approach. Yeah? In, in, uh, in fiducial markers, you design a digital marker model first. First, you have the digital representation of what should be in the environment, then you print it out or manufacture it or whatever, uh, and put it there. Um, and then you search for it again in the whatever sensor, camera, images, and make a comparison. In natural feature tracking, the physical features exist first, so that could be, well, whatever you have can be man-made, but uh, should not be designed just for tracking purposes, should serve another purpose. Um, and then the tracking model is reconstructed second. Um, and there are many of these marker designs. The most prominent ones are probably these square fiducial markers. They are mostly known as AR Toolkit. So Mark Billinghurst, the inventor of AR Toolkit, will speak, uh, speak to us uh, later today. But there are also uh, circular markers, and uh, some of them even in color. There are tons of variations. Uh, they all follow a very similar principle. I only discovered, uh, I only discussed uh, the square design here because it's the most, the most easiest to follow. Um, so you start with capturing an image that contains the marker somehow. And uh, then one pipeline that would be very efficient is you take the image, you threshold it such that you get a pure black and white image, then you search for uh, closed black contours, uh, and this is ensured by the design that has this white border around the black border. So there must always be a closed black contour if the marker is visible. Then you find the four corners of the square shape. Uh, from the four corners, these are four sort of four norm point configurations. You can infer uh, the six degrees of freedom of the camera pose. Um, and uh, this uh, pose, this is not done in one step. You also need to do some numerical refinement there. Um, that's basically saying that I want to minimize the nonlinear projection error. Uh, again, we're not doing mass today, but just uh, on, on, on a conceptual understanding level, what you're trying to do is minimize the pixel error in image space. Yeah? How much should I move the camera to the left, right, and so on? such that the error is minimal. Uh, this is not the same thing as finding the truly optimal 3D pose, which is harder to find, but it's good enough for presenting the augmentations which are again placed in image space. And then you have that pose and then you render it uh, even on a 2005 phone. You know, this was one of our first uh, implementations of, of that principle. But then my, 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 my former student, Daniel Wagner, uh, was quite a wizard at writing code on, on this, this mass bar form factor phone with Windows CE. Uh. Okay, um, th there's, there's one more thing with these markers. You, you also want to discriminate multiple markers uh, if you want any uh, slightly more complicated application. And that is done by just embedding a barcode type uh, pattern inside the, the square. This is basically the same that you know from data matrix or QR code or even the things that are in the supermarket, uh, which is just a bit code, essentially. You have to put a lot of bits into a redundant encoding so you don't make any decoding errors. Uh, but then it still allows for several thousands of markers which is more than anybody would like to see. Remember I told you that I put up all these different markers in my university building and uh, nobody wanted them. There's, there's similar principles like spherical targets um, uh, that I'll discuss in a moment, uh, where you use uh, different configurations of spheres or there have also been systems such as C at UNC Chapel Hill where they use pulsing LEDs in the ceiling. You know, there's uh, basically everything that describes a bit code of some sort could be used uh, as a kind of marker or could be interpreted as a kind of marker. 
I'm sure you have all seen these retroreflective ball markers in the systems like OptiTrack or Vicon or ART-Track um, that uh, work on the principle that you find these, uh, these balls uh, or LEDs uh, in some kind of space. And this is most often used for motion capturing as uh, suggested in the, in the images in this slide here. You can also use it to track arbitrary objects. And in the end, you yeah, only finding the balls, uh, you're finding the right configuration of balls and you're estimating the pose from there using a slightly different uh, form of uh, pose algorithm that, uh, that uh, then we use in the, in the flat markers. But for augmented reality, we can't place markers everywhere and usually we only have the camera image at our disposal. So natural features are much more uh, interesting and they actually give even nicer results if carefully done uh, because we have now a much richer input to process. We have this, let's say, two or four million pixel image incoming, uh, but now we need to make some sense of it. Um, and uh, this works by detecting, well, natural features or interest points in the image uh, because we cannot process the, the whole image usually. This is too much information. We need to condense it somehow, but we're not only condensing it to an, uh, sort of a, a artificially, intentionally uh, placed pattern, we're condensing it to information that just uh, seems to carry important information. So this is usually some kind of, of corner feature because we're always going for images, for, gra uh, for gradients in the image domain, uh, for lines or uh, some sort of uh, threshold there. And uh, if you have a corner, then you have a gradient in both image dimensions, which makes it easy to detect and also easy to locate again if you're actually searching for it. Yeah? One could also use edge features, but then the problem with edge features is th that an edge is not a unique position in space. An edge is a, a line and uh, therefore has a, a one additional degree of freedom to consider. Um, so we search for these images and then, so in a nutshell, we match the interest points uh, to a tracking model database. So we always need a model beforehand. Uh, the database will typically be filled with the results of a 3D reconstruction. And uh, since matching entire images or sub-images would be too costly, there's this whole sort of uh, craft of designing descriptors which are compact representations of a particular feature point. So rather than taking a, a little sub-image and storing it into the database, we use a statistical description of that sub-image and that is easier to find and more discriminative when we're doing the matching. Um, yes? Previous slide. Is that practical to be able to look up a feature to Oh yes, oh yes, that's absolutely practical and much better than market tracking, both in terms of the it's not annoying, but it also is more stable if you do it the right way. But wouldn't it be more efficient if you were to actually recognize an object to be what it is? And because one of the things you say is that it has to remain stable. How do you know that object? Is uh, I'm, I'm getting to that in a second, but uh, I mean, I have to ask your question back. How would you recognize that an object is an object? How would you recognize that a chair is a chair? You would do it. You would do so by using a statistical aggregation of what's called a shape descriptor. That's a slightly different type of descriptor. Um, and, and yes, I'm not talking deep learning here. That would be even one step forward. Uh, Maybe that's what you're going to get to. But yeah, yeah. Instead of doing it. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite finished yet. It, it's a bottom-up approach. You start with low-level computations, low-level features that by themselves are not very strong, but then you aggregate them until you have the finding that you're looking for. Yeah? Because if you don't start with the low-level things, then you have no way to subdivide the problem. You would have to search for a chair shape in the entire image, and the chair could have millions of different poses, so that's not practical. Yeah? You have to start with things that can be uh, determined in a local 
neighborhood inside the image. So a single scan over the image and searching for relevant information and then aggregating that information upwards towards higher level semantic information is the kind of uh, approach that is uh, practical, more practical. So if I may jump in yeah. for just a second. <clears throat> um, I think there's an interesting uh, um, development in uh, computer vision over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, and so the, the, the uh, the, the marker detection was the first one that was actually even before that, but the natural features uh, kind of came about when the SIFT technology, which is on the next slide, really made a splash. So SIFT was the first feature that was so stable and so readily recognized from different vantage points, different lighting conditions, different uh, places, that suddenly it was possible to use the same identification of just a point in the physical environment reliably to identify features. And that is the first step to object detection. So that's, that was yep. kind of the, the next generation after the like, uh, 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 markers of, uh, uh, of computer vision uh, applied to augmented reality. Now we're getting to the point where we can use like, information from all pixels, right? Because suddenly uh, we have more processing power. Back then, it was limited to the identification features, which make actually a sparse representation of the scene. Yep. SIFT was the first technology that was really, really <coughs> successful. It was not fast enough for real time. Dieter's group has made it fast so that it could actually implement, be implemented on uh, um, mobile devices. But that's the transition. And maybe now we're at the point where we can do this on a pixel by pixel level. Not quite yet, but maybe. Um, you have to see the following. Take a phone from 2000, let, let's stick with a phone, yeah, because it's maybe easier to, to grasp. Uh, a phone from 2003, it had a camera, it had computing capabilities, but very, very poor. A VGA camera, very poor lighting, uh, lots of sensor noise, and uh, a 400, 400 megahertz single core CPU. This is the the PDA lovers in the, in the audience had this 400 megahertz devices. Yeah? Um, and then 10 years later, um, you have a, I don't know, quad core phone and multi megapixel camera, and uh, now we're just uh, uh, getting fancier and fancier. And for this first generation, you could do these black and white fiducial markers. Second generation, this pays off, and it's kind of still of state of the art. And now we're progressively moving towards harvesting the whole image information, not just these are like 500 features or so out of a 2 million pixel image. Um, and, uh, and now we're trying to use the entire 2 million pixels and maybe one of the trends that one can see there is with the help of deep learning, a lot of the matching can be moved to a pre-processing phase, which can be done in the cloud and doesn't have to happen online on, on, on the device. Yeah? But it's too early to, to conclude about uh, what is going on right now. Uh, but this is already a progress, but it was only enabled by better cameras and better computing uh, devices. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was kind of waiting to be harvested until the, the, the hardware foundations were sufficient. Um, These yeah. Natural features are still, they're not at object level, right? They're they are uh, low level features, yes. So what, what typically goes on is you take some kind of image patch where you uh, find that there's, you have first a corner detector, like Harry's, um, or, or a difference of, uh, of Gaussian pyramids. Um, then you go take a little image patch, maybe not an 8 by 8, more like a 64 by 64 pixel patch. You, you uh, segment it into regions and you do a histogram of the per pixel gradients, image gradients there, and you end up with the information uh, shown here on the right hand side, which is a bunch of little histograms. And now you look for the maximum of the histogram and this is basically the information that you're keeping. What are the dominant gradients spread across the image? Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. There's actually a, an image hierarchy approach uh, on top of that as well. But in the end, you're storing, um, 
you're storing the peaks of the histograms in the image areas, and this turns out to be the most stable and, and, and uh, most versatile approach. And there's tons of variations of that, and some people don't do it in a, uh, in a square pattern, checkerboard pattern, some do it in a daisy rotational pattern and so on. Um, there's uh, features that condense everything down to one bit. Yeah? So you're only storing one bit of information for each of these uh, histogram uh, uh, maxima and so on. Uh, but they all operate on, on similar principles. Uh, oh, and of course, uh, image intensities are normalized, so you make things more comparis comparable and uh, uh, resilient against lighting changes. Um, and if you find these features, and if you match them across images, then you can do stereo triangulation. This is the topic that we had already mentioned in the morning. Uh, and you end up with a 3D reconstruction. And I'm sure you have seen things like that. So that is, uh, I believe, work that was done by Jonathan Ventura uh, while he was a graduate student at UCSB. So this is UCSB. And it looks a little bit like the... Um, the photo photo tourism application from Microsoft. Yeah, so this is just the structure from motion system that takes multiple images, does stereo matches, and produces 3D information out of that. Uh, and this is the kind of database that we're building. We are extracting these SIFT features, we're matching them, and we're storing the associated 3D coordinates in a database. And now we can go and match that with whatever we find in the live image. And here you see uh, a picture of the uh, from the historic city of Padua in Italy, with matches between the live image and the reference view in the database color encoded. And you can see that there's a lot of consistency um, between the matched point features. And now we can use probabilistic search methods to deal with the errors. There are some things that can't be right, like the clouds from the day the image was taken to the clouds on the day when I'm trying to run augmented reality, of course don't match. And they would screw up my, my pose estimate, but I can uh, identify them as outliers because they're inconsistent, they're incongruent with the majority of the information. Uh, and by uh, defining the right kind of data structures and running some uh, statistical algorithms like random sampling consensus on them, uh, we can obtain a pose which is kind of a majority pose and that is usually the right thing. Yeah? And, and this is how these, these things work. And this is the main um, input to a conventional tracking system that is sometimes called tracking by detection because what we're really doing is we're not tracking information across frames, we're detecting completely fresh, completely anew in every image, um, the pose. And the pose in this image has nothing to do with the pose in the last image. Of course, I will only have moved the camera by five millimeters, but the system doesn't know about it. It, it uh, blindly goes into this sequence of key point detection, descriptor creation, matching, pose estimation. And that's what you get. Now that is kind of wasteful. Um, because we're not exploiting the coherence that, uh, that happens with a smooth camera motion. Um, and therefore, systems that combine detection and tracking uh, become very attractive. And uh, what you see here is that we have two modes. We have this detection mode that could run all by itself. But then there's also an incremental tracking mode, which is complementary in the sense that it's building on the information that it already knows where the pose was in the last frame. So it's going to be very similar. And you can, you know, sort of Jump, uh, jump from frame to frame to frame to frame and always continue tracking with less computational load and also with better success rates because um, you can rule out spurious matches that just don't make any sense. Yeah? You know where to search and uh, the search space is smaller because of this prior assumption. And this, this idea of doing two things at once is also carried over into uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. This is uh, like the, the most important discipline uh, with relation to, to tracking now. Um, localization and tracking are kind of synonymous here. Uh, it originally comes from robotics, where you're trying to make an autonomously navigating robot. So this robot doesn't know the environment and therefore has to map it while moving through it. Um, and uh, this is uh, what we're doing here. We 
simultaneous, we start with zero knowledge, we simultaneously build the 3D model using uh, the equivalent of a structure from motion approach, while we also track ourselves relative to the starting point. Yeah, so this would be an instance of model free tracking where no preparation phase is necessary, and instead you start um, just with, a, with, a, with an initial motion, so usually there's some kind of, of initialization phase. Uh, you determine a relative camera pose uh, from the first few matches and you build as you go. And now, of course, this is much more labor intensive, in particular the mapping, which must run this complete structure from motion problem uh, and therefore incurs uh, a substantial amount of, uh, of bundle adjustment, numerical numerics, um, is very costly. And uh, the problem of the SLAM systems um, in the early 2000s was still that this was just computationally not tractable, even on desktop computers. Huh? Uh, and then Georg Klein, by the way, a fellow Austrian guy now working for Microsoft in, uh, in Redmond. Um, so he's one of the brains behind HoloLens, by the way. But he came up with this idea of parallel tracking and mapping, and that was just when you had the first multi-core devices, maybe on the desktop. Huh? So you remember scratching your head for answering the question, what am I going to do with the second core now that sits idle all the time? Well, turns out you can do tracking and mapping at the same time. Remember, tracking and detection was kind of alternating. Didn't make sense to do that at the same time. Tracking and mapping, you can do all the time, but you do the mapping much slower than the tracking. The tracking runs at full frame rate, but it's only doing a lightweight visual odometry kind of extrapolation. Whereas the mapping uh, does a, a bundle adjustment uh, for computing structure from motion information from multiple views. And since it's not operating at frame rate, it's picking keyframes. This is another key concept that you're only using every tenth frame or so to harvest the information that is there to build the map or 3D model. And that was a real breakthrough for bringing a sort of single camera monocular slam to, to mobile systems. There's, there's still some open issues and they um, have to do with the fact when, you don't, when you're really trying to use that in the wild, when you're trying to use that outdoors and by untrained users who just do any kind of stupid motion. Uh, and then this assumption that you have some frame-to-frame -frame coherence just breaks. And in particular, what is bad is if you tell people to make a sideway motion, yeah? what they will do is they will turn the camera. So they are doing a trans, instead of a translation, you're asking them to do a translation, they do a rotation. And that just breaks every conventional SLAM system because no new information comes in. The new information only comes in if you have a baseline for triangulation. And if that is not given, then the system loses track and it loses all its features and it fails. But you can also do SLAM just in orientation space Mathematically, it's the equivalent, and I just have to decide whether this is going to be a translational or a rotational motion, and that can be done using either uh, some image, heurist some heuristics on the image, or the inertial sensors, or both at the same time. Um, and uh, and uh, if you combine this kind of uh, technology, then you get uh, you get a much more versatile slam. Um, or you have a depth sensor at your disposal. This was another very significant uh, achievement, the Kinect Fusion algorithm, which is basically a real-time version of an older approach for combining multiple depth maps into a, what's called a truncated sign distance function. This is just a volumetric representation of a scene where you store zero for every surface and then non-zero values for, for other non-surface voxels, and uh, that has been used in, let's say, integrating radar images or whatever for a long time in, in geological surveying uh, for over 10 years. Uh, and you can do that, uh, you can combine that with a tracking based on an iterative closest point method in real time with some clever GPU programming. So again, something helps us, something comes along, namely um, GPUs can do parallel algorithms very well, and uh, if you have a point cloud, then every point is independent, so it parallelizes well. Um, and in the end, you get a dense SLAM system based on what the depth sensor will give us. And uh, 
This can be combined with the inexpensive depth sensors, in particular the Microsoft Kinect came out around 2000 or a little later. Anyway, now we have these commodity depth sensors. You can buy them for, I don't know, $60, $70 for a PC or they're built into your phone even. Um, and uh, that allows you to do de dense slam, but only within the range of the depth sensor, which is typically up to 10 meters or so, uh, based on some kind of active illumination limitations <laughs> that it has. Uh, yeah, um, so up to now, all of this is primarily relevant for doing small scale tracking, where you have some kind of gaming environment or you're doing something indoors. Uh, it gets much more interested, and this is essentially not really solved if you try to do geospatial localization. Now, the same thing that GPS will give you, but uh, using, uh, but with highest precision, with centimeter level accuracy. Um, and uh, if you can solve that, you can also do more. You can solve the relocalization problem for SLAM systems as well, which is known as the kidnapped robot problem. Yeah, you kidnap the robot, drop it off somewhere else in the city. How can the robot find out where it is? Well, th then you have to ramp up your, your, your tool set a little more um, because, of course, things are getting more challenging. So the first thing is wide field of view pictures. We have done some work that is shown here with panorama localization as opposed to conventional image localization. And if you're trying to do this matching that we just discussed before, and you try to scale it up to city size, then the problem is that there's not much to match here down the street. Yeah, this is all noise, basically, people moving and so on. You're only getting reliable matches with respect to the facades. And if you look here, for example, then this area would not have enough matches for reliable matching. So if you go all the way 360, then suddenly you get enough matches, basically, you, you you know, you get all these ropes to everywhere. Uh, and this makes, so wider field of view is better. That's not surprising and that's an important message. And we're now seeing that embedded in, for example, the HoloLens and the Google Tango because their primary mode of operation is one or two wide angle cameras. And you never get to see the picture of that. The HoloLens has this center camera, which is a conventional 60 degree field of view camera, or maybe 70. But then there's this uh, 150 degree of field of view cameras by the sides that are only used for the tracking and that do exactly that. We used stitching for that. We did real time stitching, which is another option. And instead of the panorama images, you could also try to use um, a SLAM map if you have a SLAM system. And this would lead to an approach that uh, has uh, three parallel components because now suddenly you can do two things on the client, namely the tracking and the mapping that we have already discussed. And you also do the matching with, with a large pre-existing feature database on some kind of cloud service. And suddenly you get uh, uh, an outdoor localization system that is actually scalable. This is uh, just a yellow overlay on, on, on the architecture that is on the main square of, of the city of Graz. And uh, this is kind of the really interesting picture because here you see a sequence where we basically would be losing track of the facade if we only had the stationary model of the architecture. Yeah? And the last picture, like the bottom row, you would not be able to track the global pose anymore just from what you have in the in the feature database that is pre-existing. But the system via SLAM is picking up new information and in this case I usually say that this uh, poster for a uh, it's, it's actually about an opera buffer that I personally hate, so <laughs> I'm always kind of uh, reluctant to show this image. But it shows that the system can now track off this poster as, uh, and not uh, of the uh, city model anymore. And that's one way that outdoor uh, localization could go, and uh, it's fairly promising, but you have two downsides. One is you still need to establish a baseline for triangulation to make the slam work, and outdoors this can mean walking sideways 10 meters, so that's something that people don't want to do. And the server needs a recent and dense city model, which means the Google cars that scan everything have to drive now not every year, but every month or so, and then it's still not good. Um, to, to get this big database. So we, we tried uh, something else very recently, 
global localization only from 2D maps. You know, the, the general question is, how can I get enough information cheaply? What does exist is OpenStreetMap or maybe Bing Maps or whatever, if you have the access. Uh, that can give you a very coarse um, description of the main buildings if you extrude them. Um, and then we can uh, very quickly detect facade outlines in the camera image uh, and match them with, um, with the, the model, the, the, the two and a half D model from the 2D map. Uh, so for example, the sensors would give us the blue estimate, the, with sensors I mean GPS and compass, and then we can basically snap that to the green lines and produce proper augmentations by doing some uh, computer vision algorithms that, uh, that do the facade matching. And that delivers a fairly nice experience. Uh, so maybe I show one little video clip here. Yeah, so this is the main square of Graz again, and this is kind of a nightmarish scenario where you have advertisements all over the place. But you see that they stick. And you see that it's not cheated because they actually wiggle a bit. That's just the noise from the, from the RANSAC filter that we haven't attempted to remove. Um, so this is, this is genuine outdoor um, you know, an augmented reality algorithm that only requires information that you can actually afford to produce. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, uh, glimpse over the sensor fusion part. There's multiple ways how you can combine the sensors. One you have already seen. Uh, you can, um, one you have already seen that would be the cooperative sensor fusion. Uh, where, for example, I start with a GPS measurement and then I use it to narrow down the search space in a visual measurement. Huh? And the second possibility is just complementary sensor fusion. I'm combining sensors with different degrees of freedom um, to obtain more, you know, more general information. Like I have something for the position and then some other sensor for the orientation. The most complex sensor fusion, and that has been part of some of the methods that I have described, although I have not stated it so much, is when you use the statistical kind of filtering. Yeah? When you get concurrent information and uh, you are not just combining it, but you, you're building a statistical model based on how likely are these various sensor readings uh, supposed to appear in combination. Um, and that is really the only a scalable approach where you can arguably exploit the entire uh, 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 value of the sensory information. But it gets relatively computationally demanding. Um, okay, so, but this is definitely an important ingredient because if you're trying to go outdoors, you need to get, you need to take whatever you can get, uh, and that will usually include all the sensors that are on board a kind of mobile device. Okay. Um, I know this was a little bit of a tour de force, uh, but uh, we are at the end of the tracking segment. So um, if you have any questions, now's the time. Yes? It's more of a technical question, but um, in the slide where you show, uh, you can actually detect and calibrate the camera from the, from the markers. I know that all the points on the marker lie on the same place, so do you meet the uh, degenerate case? How do you calibrate the camera if you have um, You can have markers that are planar and you can have markers that are non-planar. There are calibration methods for both. It's just different mathematics. But you have to know in the case if they're not planar, you have to know. Yeah, you have to know which one is which, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the correspondence. Actually, if they're planar, it's actually worse. It's only the simplest algorithm, but it doesn't scale. Five points in the plane don't buy you more than four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you brought up the method for outlier removal with, like, say, the clouds earlier on, right? Um, yeah. Is it too costly to use deep learning methods or classification methods to remove outliers if they're, say, it's like an outdoor uh, scenery um, with a lot of, like, kind of noise you're talking about? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, 
probably there will be some solutions that use deep learning, but you know, deep learning is now used for everything. Yeah? It's kind of a shortcut. If you have a difficult problem and you have some kind of algorithm on a very general level, not even limited to tracking or computer vision, uh, if you have lots of data, if you have an algorithm that can produce a comparison, yeah, basically it constitutes a loss function if we're uh, speaking the, the language of deep learning, then you can train something which will then be able to compute a similar result faster online. Yeah? Uh, but the problem is always that you need enough training data, which means you need to be able to collect the training data in the first place. Um, if I have the Google cars driving around the city and building an entire city model, I can probably use that data for some learning, but then I would have to redo that every time I uh, Ch scan for changes, um, and definitely I cannot do the learning online because that uh, is just too computationally costly even with cloud computing. So uh, it, it's only asymmetric. It only works if you can afford the offline learning stage, and that usually has to be a big thing, to, you, know, you know, big, big iron work. I have a related question. Yeah. So for object detection, you can go the safe, uh, the feature route, or you can go the state of the deep learning line, or faster CNN. So how would you decide to choose one versus the other? Um, I'm, I'm not telling you that deep learning is a bad thing, but it's not the, the you know, the golden hammer solution for everything. Um, if you want to be flexible, the preparation phase of the deep learning will kill you. Yeah? Um, if I'm Mattel and I want to ship a tracker for, my, my, for the AR app that comes with my latest toy and I'm going to sell 10 million uh, product, uh, products, all the same, all exactly the same, up to the specification of the color shade of the plastic or whatever, then I can probably also invest into some deep learning. If you're on a construction site and things change every day and you're trying to stay ahead of the game, by using some scanning via SLAM, yeah, then deep learning is not an option because you would have to do the you have to would have to scan by day and then do the learning by night in order to be up and running on the next day. Yeah, that's not you want to be you want to be flexible. You want to go out, scan, and then immediately do stuff there. Yeah? In, in indoor VR environment where things are not changing. Things are always changing. This is one of the things to understand about computer vision. The assumption of visual constancy is a perceptual illusion. Yeah? Uh, I can show you some. You, you will t say that my, my blue jeans are actually blue. Yeah? If I take a camera picture and, and take the color patch and get the RGB colors in this light, it will not be blue. It will not be in the blue domain. It will be significantly shifted towards... I don't know what, yeah, uh, but uh, things visually things are always changing. So your question was specifically on object recognition, right? So, uh, so I think it's important to note that <coughs> feature-based computer vision does not solve object recognition per se, by no means. So it's it's a step towards tracking, and the semantics are a completely separate step. So for semantics, uh, you would probably use a uh, machine learning uh, uh, approach. That can be either be used with features or without features, just based on all pixels or just on a sparser representation of the scene. You can make that uh, uh, um, decision of what actually is your input to your, to your learning uh, uh, problem. But so, so far today, when, when semantics uh, are concerned, learning is the definite front runner. Because to do that algorithmically by describing the shapes, it's just shown currently it's not, it's not at the same scale as, uh, uh, as the automatic learner. So for object recognition, I would definitely say the learning route is, is, is currently. Yeah, correct. but. but thing? For tracking, not necessarily. Is, is that a computational thing? Or is it, you know, well, I mean, so deep, deep, deep learning is a shortcut. Right? Deep learning is a shortcut for everything. If you have a huge problem, like a huge problem uh, of recognizing a huge variety of objects from a huge database, then the, the deep learning can give you the shortcut that you need to make it practical, uh, like in many other applications. But if your database is 
always changing or doesn't even exist, then you don't have a use case for the deep learning. And this is some kind of misunderstanding. You cannot do the deep learning online. If you don't know beforehand what you're going to look for, then you can't apply the deep learning because you can collect all the data, do the learning, then you would be good to go, but then it's already too late because then the opportunity for deploying that is, is over. Yeah? Um, and uh, you, c you probably can also not at the moment let uh, end users do their own deep learning. It can be uh, outsourced to the cloud or something like that, but the procedure of getting that right is just too, too brittle to really make sense. Yeah? There's a yeah. brief comment about moving from sparse SIF correspondences to denser using yeah. more pixels or maybe all the pixels. Can you touch briefly on how that method might work? Densifying, uh, um, densifying everything. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, again, this is a computational, uh, a problem of the computational complexity. Um, if you have um, dense, imp I mean, we usually have dense input information. So the obvious thing to do is uh, use all that information. And actually, the first tracking systems, like the Lucas Canade type tracking in the 1990s, uh, used dense, dense image uh, matching, but at I don't know what kind of run times <laughs> overnight <laughs> for a single image, something like that, um, and. Uh, and the problem is really how do you harvest the information that, that comes from some kind of sensor stream or image stream. Uh, you're definitely better off um, if you do it dense. For example, there's also a, a, a variant called dense sift, which just applies the sift descriptor to every pixel. Yeah? Um, and that's super, gives super results, but that is super uneconomical. Um, Instead, there have been some schemes devised that run in near real time or even real time uh, at least on a GPU, uh, but it still means that you have to perform uh, two million matching operations per frame at a rate of 30 hertz or 60 hertz or something like that, so it's still challenging. Huh? However, it can be, my prediction is that this can be, with dedicated hardware, it would be relatively easy to build dedicated hardware to do these kind of things. Huh? The basic approach Which is Partial. Is the optical flow kind of approach, or is it a descriptor matching kind of approach? That you well, both exist. But, but the optical flow, I mean, you can actually, if you do dense, you can uh, go for simpler uh, type of search approaches uh, because of the redundancy of the information. This, and, and it's going to work in cases where you have, for example, pure, uh, poor texture, uh, whether the massive amount of information that you're considering will still give you robustness uh, where uh, sparse feature uh, models wouldn't work. So for real-time applications, uh, you have to uh, still today with uh, mobile hardware uh, um, work on uh, like not a fully dense but a semi-dense approach at max. And there are methods to, uh, to get from, so you, you pick those smartly, right? So you, you can actually work uh, uh, mostly on high gradients in your image, which gives you most of the information. And then there's densification algorithms that, that from that actually nicely fill in the pixels in between. And that gives you enough uh, uh, to even do image-based rendering, like uh, realistic reconstructions of the same scene from a different camera angle than you, than you would have observed. So, so that is all, uh, all possible. But the trend is very clear. Uh, as Dieter said, it started out with theoretically dense, right? Because that's the obvious thing to do. You have full information. Then real-time vision with practical real-time applications became interesting. So then it had to be sparse because we didn't have the programming power. In the last four or five years, we have seen semi-dense uh, successful uh, implementations because we now have more processing power. So if you draw that trajectory, we will see dense impl uh, implementations yeah. on massively parallel mobile platforms. So the, so the commercially relevant dense is mostly in conjunction with time of flight sensors now, which have a relatively low image resolution compared to, to visible light sensors. So just to give you some numbers, the a VGA image is like half a million pixels. Um, computer vision will, cameras will use, I don't know, one to two million pixels. Semi-dense would maybe be 10% of that. So the dense time of flight is like the semi-dense <coughs> visible light. Yeah? 
Um, and I'm always assuming that the same amount of information comes in, which is not exactly the case depending on the field of view and the, the, the value of uh, depth gradients from time of flight versus image gradients, which are not one and the same thing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of design freedom there. Uh, but generally, you have to seek a match between the uh, computational capacity that you have and uh, the richness of the input stream in order to optimize your results. And uh, every five years, this sweet spot changes a little bit. Yes? Kind of a follow-on question to that. So you're talking a little bit about sensor fusion, and you skipped the last part, but that's okay. But as you were showing the 2D map that you were mapping back to some of the GPS, I can't remember, compass location, yeah. is there sort of a, um, a minimum requirement for that 2D map in combination with the kind of sensors you have in order to map it out? Meaning, do you actually need like a 2D picture, or could you have more like SIF data if you had more sensors on board? There's something like where the distributed part of information is. Yeah, so I described uh, several options of what input information you could have. And for outdoors, well, I mean, you've you got to have something to compare to, obviously. Sure. Um, you get a course pose from GPS, but that is really only a, a sort of a, a narrowing down of the search space uh, to make the problem tractable at all. And then you take whatever you can get. If you can get um, a then some kind of reconstruction, some visual reconstruction of the environment, let's say a, a collection of SIFT features, that's one way to go. And then the other potential source of information is basically what's in the street map. Okay. Yeah? So um, and no there we are using the, the fact that you can guess what the building outlines are. And this is also geometric or visual, well, pseudo-visual information that, that can be used there. And these are two sources of information, and both deliver valid systems, and they could be combined. Okay. So it's not the map that you were creating that you then utilize later. It's a map that you have... No, I, I mean, I, I'm, sorry if I, I'm sorry if I was too quick because I was running behind schedule, but the idea is that the, it's very costly to build these 3D city models. I mean, Bing Maps is doing it, and... Uh, of course, uh, but they're not doing it particularly for outdoor AR localization. Um, and uh, as we just mentioned, there's a lot of uh, visual change in the world. And so producing and maintaining those models would be exorbitant. And uh, in contrast, OpenStreetMap is also crowdsourced effort. Um, it's actually free and has high, despite the fact that it's free, it has high quality. Uh, and we, we basically experimented whether this could also be used successfully, and yes, it can. Um, but in the end, you will have to take whatever information you can get. If I can uh, afford to build a 3D SIFT model or whatever, that would probably be the preferred way of doing it. Uh, if I can pay the bill. <laughs> yes? Um, what other... Uh Descriptors could be used, and are there some that are more suitable to depth maps? For depth maps, um, there's. Topic, yeah. um, I I don't know if you. I'm I'm, I'm sure there are, um, but uh, this is not my specific uh, uh, my specific uh, area of expertise. Yeah, I I don't have them on out of on the top top of my head right now uh, either, but it is a, I know it is a, a, um, a growing um, field in the computer vision community to take uh, uh, features in 3D space from point clouds yeah. or uh, dense uh, reconstructions and, uh, um, and work with them. Um, it's the same overall mathematical uh, uh, principles that uh, you look at the neighborhood of points and try to statistically uh, uh, kind of cartograph them, uh, um, but um, uh, my best uh, advice would be to look at the recent uh, uh, computer vision uh, conferences, ICCV, uh, CVPR, uh, and there's definitely uh, papers there uh, that, uh, that introduce new features in that space. 
so, so quite honestly, there are some things that are hard to follow when, when, when the computer vision community, which is huge, uh, uh, discovers an attractive, an attractive topic such as designing networks for deep learning uh, or designing feature descriptors, there's an explosion of works. Um, and you can only observe some trends. So th these are with, with the 3D features, but I haven't particularly followed that. For the, in general, while SIFT is considered the gold standard for, well, at least uh, conventional intensity images, there are these successors that use very compact bit-wise encodings, such as Brief or ORP, that are now a brisk, that are now the most popular ones, because they are so compact and they can be implemented with bit operations so efficiently that you can do 10 times more feature matching. Um, and they have uh, some loss of, of descriptive power compared to a full-blown SIFT, but uh, um, they beat this, this tenfold increase of throughput beats, beats the outcome by far. But that's for, for conventional intensity images. And then when, if you have real 3D shape, then obviously, um, the question of how to encode the shape as such and not just the image of a shape becomes more relevant. And I'm, I won't try to comment on well, that now. On your, on your question, uh, it, is, it is actually like the input domain is, 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 is ill-defined, right? What are you uh, actually computing your 3D descriptor on? Is it a point cloud that you get from LiDAR? Is it uh, a point cloud that you get from structure from motion, which is much denser? Is it CAD? Exactly. Is it a, is it a 3D model? Uh, I mean, so, so it's not even clear yet, and that's why there isn't as big a market for these kind of descriptors than for images, which are super well defined. It's pixels, very clearly, and all on the same level, right? It's just different at in intensities and, uh, um, uh, like, uh, 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 different encodings, but uh, it's all the same thing. In the 3D domain, it's not as clear, clear cut. Well, uh, there's a big increase in the sales of uh, mo mobile LiDAR mapping units, uh, okay. which produce enormously dense point clouds. That's right. Um, yep. and but LiDAR is, is a specific new uh, sensor that you have to kind of decide to, to put your money on, right? So it's possible that uh, future smartphones come with, uh, uh, with LiDAR sensors. Uh, entirely possible. It's, a, it's also possible that that is too, power, uh, too high power consumption and will not happen. So, uh, I mean, there's other ways to get to point clouds, as I just enumerated. And so they are very different. And when the point clouds are different, then the descriptors will also be different. Or you have to find a descriptor that scales from one to the other, which would be the sift of 3D features, right? Which is probably something worth, uh, worth researching. Yeah. So, so I hope that's not a frustrating answer, but this is a large uh, uh, design space for technologies. And uh, if you can define some prerequisites, like uh, we would like to build on LiDAR scanners because they are now becoming more uh, more ubiquitous, uh, then you can choose some some methods. Huh? But this will not be a. Gen I mean, the the sort of the obvious dominant uh, development will be based on what the mass market for the hardware is. Um, it's it's safe to say that there will be camera phones and there will be more digital cameras with with conventional imaging. And uh, so this, you know, some of the choices in what material to present today uh, have to do with that. Um, and then uh, maybe you know that LiDAR is going to be the next sensor that will be in every phone. Yeah, there was a big discussion whether gyroscopes would make it into phones about 10 years ago because the, the first uh, devices were too power hungry and too expensive, and they did. Yeah? So one time I would have guessed right about this new uh, uh, direct depth sensing uh, methods. I'm not, I'm not really sure. This is difficult to predict. Well, I think there's a consensus that they're going into cars. And I guess yeah. there are more. Yeah, uh, again, ma many, many of the things that we described today would also apply to automotive sensing, but with a grain of salt, of course because uh, different trade-offs may 
um, may be made there. There's uh, less, I mean, cars have more power budget, but not too much. I mean, don't, don't overestimate that. Uh, but uh, you cannot expect, I mean, you, that <laughs> it's, it's much more decoupled from what the driver does, right? In, in an augmented reality system, you always have a human operator who can uh, help, but also destroy any kind of, of technique. In a car, you have at least something that the car can do by itself. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> Okay, last question maybe because we should move on. Working with uh, own lens, yeah. uh, how easy is it to, uh, to merge two positional uh, targets? Let's say I have this object full of targets because yeah. I'm scanning it. And with my own lens, I want the result to appear like how easy to merge this model of targets to the own lens uh, area. Well, uh, so we, we've praised HoloLens for its, for its technology today. We should also uh, curse it because of the limited uh, SDK and the, <laughs> the limited exposure of features that they have right now. Um, and people I know at Microsoft tend to agree with me. Uh, one of the things is the HoloLens will give you back a polygonal mesh that from its 3D scanning activities, very rough, yeah, very, very that rough. is very rough and you have zero influence over what you get. Yeah? So you could try to do what you say, scan something, get the mesh back, and then display this mesh in a different kind of environment or the same environment, doesn't really matter. Um, but you have no control over what this mesh entails and doesn't entail and what the resolution of that result is. Uh, very, very frustrating because obviously there's some high quality scanning going on um, and they don't give you, well, I mean, I know why they don't give you the results. There's technical reasons for that. Uh, so even while this would work in theory, in practice with the current HoloLens implementation and software, you will have difficulties doing that. Because they don't and give you... And it sounds you like you have your own model yeah. that is much more accurate than what the HoloLens would yeah. give you. People now you want to do model-based tracking, yeah. which is more accurate than what the HoloLens, again, gives you. So and it's not easy with the current HoloLens API to bring your own model in and track from that. So, so there's, plenty of, easy at all. There's, there's plenty of additional software that is now being ported to the HoloLens, including Euphoria, That's for right. example. And what people will do is they will use the object detection from Euphoria on top of the tracking of the HoloLens, even though it's totally stupid to do redundant work. It's certainly much load on the processor that is no additional gain. The HoloLens could do it all by itself. Yeah. 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 Because it's not open, right? And so you have to do that right now. And maybe that's maybe it's good. I mean, maybe maybe the Euphoria people can talk Microsoft into exposing their interface at least to them or something like that. You yeah. say HoloLens is an open. Well, they have an API that they designed, but yeah. they don't give you access to the uh, the direct. So the HoloLens will have an API that gives you the biggest planar patch it can find to put your Skype window there. But it doesn't tell you how big this is going to be. It doesn't tell you whether it's going to be upright. Or I think you can say you want it upright or something like that. But it's like, it's like you go to a candy store and say, give me a chocolate bar. And it could be Mars or Milky Way. And you have no control over that. Huh? And you don't get uh, the uh, footage even from the wide field of your cameras. Yeah. You can't get to it right now. It's not exposed. You do get uh, the footage from the front-facing camera. but. If you want to do your own tracking, you would want those. Uh, so that's all black box tracking yeah. that you get. Oh, and the, the depth sensor is used for the gesture interface, but that's you right. don't get the depths. You just get the gesture detections. Right. And they don't let you define your own gestures. So OK, we, we stop complaining now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, this is all good uh, to know if you're a starting developer. Uh, it is uh, um, a great platform, great uh, product, uh, but uh, um, it comes with, uh, with limited design decisions at the moment. Uh, it's good to, uh, to lobby for, for more access from, uh, for, from the developers community, for sure. OK. Um, shall, shall we do a little bit of uh, 
work on the rendering as well. So the original schedule says I have half an hour left. <laughs> uh, I'll do the, the essence. Yes, so, so despite all appearances, I'm actually a computer graphics uh, person coming from a computer graphics background. Uh, and this is my favorite topic, if you want. Um, after we have a working system that gives us the input from tracking and uh, the capability to, to display, we need to show something. And uh, there's two directions how this can go. You can show just information, basically doing information visualization. Now I have another one or two hours to fill with that at least, uh, because it needs to be done in a way that the person can actually process the information. That's where, the, from my point of view, the cognitive abilities come in. But the other uh, target, uh, which I'll address now, at least briefly, is photorealistic rendering. And uh, photorealistic rendering in, let's say, mixed reality uh, with arbitrary amounts of virtual content is obviously more difficult than conventional, say, virtual reality, because you don't have full control over what is, uh, is being shown. You need to do, well, you have to do some compositing in case of an optical see-through display. Um, you uh, can only render on top of what the, the perception of the real world. If you have a video see-through display, at least you can replace pixels in the video image entirely with computer-generated graphics or do arbitrary manipulations. This is very appealing uh, in terms of uh, the, the rendering problem. But in any case, you have to take the interaction between real and uh, virtual into account. So here's a virtual reality or computer game scenario where everything is virtual. And uh, there's a virtual light source, there's a virtual camera, there's uh, virtual objects, uh, there's virtual shadows uh, cast by virtual objects illuminated by the virtual light source and so on. Yeah? Um, in, a, in a mixed reality or augmented reality rendering, there's less information available. There's a part of the scene that is real and we may or may not have all the necessary information about that real scene. There could be, uh, well, there will always be a real light source, there will be real objects, and if you want something such as a shadow cast from a virtual object to a real object or from a real object to a virtual object, then you have to incorporate the virtual and the real objects both in the same uh, lighting simulation. Um, and that uh, can become much more difficult um, than a conventional, I mean, you know, uh, lighting simulation in computer graphics is already a kind of complicated topic. And uh, this, this combination makes it just uh, more difficult. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the simplest, which is, which is occlusion. Occlusion is an absolutely essential um, property for, the, for producing uh, convincing three-dimensional scenes because of the depth cues that we discussed in the morning. Yeah? So you want the virtual to appear in front of the real. This can be relatively easily achieved by drawing the augmentations on top of either a, uh, a video background for video see-through or on top of uh, uh, a blank nat natural view of a scene in, a, in an optical see-through display as long as you have sufficient brightness uh, in, the, in the virtual part of the, of the display so that uh, you can actually overdraw and basically over overpower the, the, the incoming light from the real world. But the difficulty is uh, come up when we try to have virtual objects that are occluded by real objects. And there's one standard way of approaching this, and this is called phantom rendering. Um, we must have a virtual representation of the real world object that is registered in the same place where the real object is. And if we manage to get that, and 3D scanning uh, would be one way of obtaining this kind of representation, then we can derive a relatively simple multi-pass uh, algorithm in, on, on, the, on the GPU, a shader basically, that draws the video, um, 
then disables the writing to the color buffer and renders this phantom object of the real scene, in this case the car body in the image, uh, to just set the depth buffer. We're only writing the depth buffer. We're not writing anything in the color buffer. Therefore, the video information remains in the color buffer. And then we draw the virtual objects after re-enabling the writing to the color buffer. And then the depth buffer will resolve whether the real or the virtual object is visible. Yeah? Uh, this is for video-based uh, augmented reality or it also works for, for see-through displays as long as the registration is fine and as long as you can obtain sufficient contrast there. Um, so this is the basic that we want to do. But it requires really accurate model data beforehand or obtained maybe with SLAM on the fly. Uh, really accurate tracking data and a good registration algorithm. And if it doesn't work, then you get this kind of effect here where the system determines that uh, there should be a little red pixel here in the cavity between the chin and the shoulder of the, of the Lego figure in the front. But unfortunately, everything is shifted a little bit up and now you have this really disturbing occlusion mismatch here, which comes from only two pixels of tracking inaccuracy. Yeah? Uh, so we're very sensible to that uh, because uh, um, it, it emphasize, I mean, you have, high, this is an area of high gradients. Yeah? I mean, also because the shirt is red, of course, but uh, uh, that is a difficult problem. So it, it really comes up to having uh, good quality phantoms and high quality tracking there. And there's a number of, uh, and this is particularly difficult if you're trying to, uh, to do it in real time. If you have a dynamically changing physical object the, the problem is where does the occlusion come from if the scene changes all the time um, and you cannot prepare for it. Um, well, obviously, you can use some scene sensing, depth sensing. Uh, so, for example, Kinect is a popular choice. Or you could do a simplified um, estimate. For example, if you look at the virtual studio situation where they show a background behind a news uh, anchor, uh, that uh, that changes, then uh, tricks can be done with illumination. You can illuminate only the foreground, and that gives you a very re reliable segmentation of the background. And basically, you get a one-bit depth segmentation, just foreground versus background, and that can be used for occlusion. Uh, or you could do things like uh, hand tracking via skin color. So here's a demo where they set your hands on fire, which is, uh, is actually pretty creepy, and. Uh, any kind of uh, sort of dynamic scene estimation or scene um, registration works. But that is only for the occlusion. This is like the, the starting point for, for photorealism. Uh, what we really want is proper lighting. And here's a very simple um, scene um, with a virtual boat. And on the left-hand side, you see what happens if you don't apply any kind of illumination because obviously the illumination would have to match the illumination of the real scene. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you see only diffuse, uh, uh, only diffuse lighting simulation, which is like uh, really cheap, but we did that in real time. And you can already see how, for example, the, the boathouse is in the shadow of the bridge. And the bridge is physical, boathouse is not. Yeah? So clearly, this is the kind of effect that we want, and we want even more. But uh, lighting simulation is rather complicated. And if we have insufficient knowledge of the environment, we need to make some simplifying assumptions. And what is typically done in all the methods uh, that exist so far is that you separate into a scene and an in, and a surrounding environment. And the surrounding environment is represented as directional light. And that is kind of fair because it works for most situations. So uh, in this room here, we don't have any windows or doors. The only significant light sources, apart from the dim ceiling lights, are these uh, uh, spots here on the side. And you can very well conceive them to be outside of the scene, because nobody here is standing behind the light sources. So it would be sufficient to model this as directional light that just has a direction and otherwise is considered to be infinitely far away, because for all that matters, we don't care. Uh, we'll make a little bit of error, but that is probably acceptable, because again, perception uh, research tells us that humans are you know, not, not too good at discriminating illumination directions precisely. 
Um, so in order to capture the incoming light in real time and then apply it to the virtual part of a mixed reality scene, we need to capture this uh, lighting information somehow. And a popular uh, approach that is used is a so-called light probe that, for example, could be a mirrored sphere. Um, so you get uh, sort of the, the light reflection from every possible direction because of the geometry of the sphere. Or you use a fisheye camera. And uh, the, what, what, what comes out of these, uh, these light probes is a so-called environment map. So this is a, a standard way of representing incident lighting, basically by putting a box around the scene. Uh, and this is a common, even hardware accelerated method in game engines to, to render reflections and, and uh, incoming illumination effects. Yeah? Uh, th typically, this will have to be represented not with the conventional standard range of 24 bits, but at a higher precision so you can uh, characterize really strong light uh, and also uh, really dim light situations. And uh, with this kind of approach, we can build a simple illumination pipeline by placing a light probe in a scene, picking that up with a camera, building an environment map, and then applying that physical environment map. Sometimes it's called image-based lighting because it changes with the, with the lighting, with the physical lighting. Uh, we can apply that to a virtual object in the scene here. Yeah? Uh, so that would already be a, a sort of valid uh, illumination pipeline for mixed reality, but of course the light probes are a real pain. Yeah? Not only do they disturb the immersive experience, but also you cannot ask a game, an AR gaming user, to put an extra camera in the scene just to to capture the lighting. Yeah? So from from a practical point of view, light probes for AR applications are completely useless. They are used in film production, for example, where any kind of uh, infrastructure is acceptable. But we can also do it without light probes. What you can see here is uh, is a setup where you use the scene itself as a light probe because in the end we're only estimating reflections. Um, so we can formulate those as a linear system relating the reflected light. This is just the, the image that we're taking for every pixel. Every pixel is an observation of reflected light. We're relating that to uh, the directional incoming light times uh, a radiance transfer matrix, which basically tells us how much incoming light is reflected across every surface point into every direction. Um, for this, we're only assuming diffuse reflections, um, so that would limit us to coarse surfaces that are not glossy and not mirrors. But you can even estimate this kind of illumination effects in real time. So here you see uh, Mario, I always have to look at the head, there's an M, so this is Mario. I also have pictures with Luigi. Um, and my students always complain if I <laughs> quote the wrong one. So Mario is, uh, is uh, 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 receiving reflections, exaggerated reflections in this case, from this red uh, ping pong paddle here. Yeah. We can also go further and uh, do some specular effects uh, by introducing uh, material segmentation. Um, what you can see here is how a, a, a 3D scan of a scene obtained with a Kinect is factored into the surface albedo, that's the, the unlit texture on the surfaces, and the incident lighting represented here by just a, a, a gray version of the model. And if we have that information, we basically have all we need to even do relighting uh, so here you see, for example, how these plate of fruits can be placed in different lighting environments. These would be more like virtual lighting environments. And it always looks nice, including some glossiness. So the trick here is that because we also apply a material segmentation, um, you can uh, get uh, um, sort of high quality surface textures. And then from all the observations, um, whatever remains as an error that can be systematically explained by specular reflections that can be uh, attributed to a, to a glossiness that is uh, stored with every object. Huh? So that means you get shiny tomatoes, for example. And I'll show you the video in the end uh, because we don't want to skip the coffee break entirely. Because I have just complained about deep learning, here's some deep learning that, 
has recently been going on in my lab. Uh, you can also learn light probes. If you, if you don't want to estimate the incident, if you want to estimate the incident lighting in every frame, and you know that there's going to be some kind of object in the scene, then you can actually learn how that object reflects light. Uh, and that will uh, allow you to look up the incident lighting without solving any linear system at all. Yeah? Uh, so uh, what you see here, hmm? yeah? So going back to that optical see-through type of model, you yeah. don't really have a camera to, for you to construct a light mo uh, model. No, no, as I said, you want to get rid of the, of the light probes. Uh, the light probes can either be a second camera placed in the scene, right? Yeah, a stationary camera in the scene, or if you only can afford the head one camera, uh, you place a chrome ball in the scene and uh, work with the reflections, which is like the cheaper alternative. Yeah? My question um, was, uh, I mean, optical see through, you don't necessarily have a uh, head one yeah. camera. You don't necessarily. If you have no camera at all, then you have no input, uh, and then you can't do any lighting estimation. Yes, that is correct. Yeah? Um, but, uh, but for example, the HoloLens has a head one camera, and multiple, multiple even, and uh, I'm kind of assuming that you have at least one camera here, otherwise you don't get any, I mean, most of the time this is used for tracking, right, so you can repurpose it. If you have no camera that is observing the scene, then of course you have no real-time input on the scene illumination, then it won't work. Yeah? So this, is, yes, this is of course true. So if you have, uh, let's say, a projector-based augmented reality and you wanted to do some of these things, um, you would still have to place some kind of camera in the scene. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, so, uh, so an additional um, approach that uh, uh, that sort of combines the advantages of the real-time lighting estimation and the avoidance of uh, disturbing objects is use a known but arbitrary object in the scene. So for example, if you have some kind of gaming situation with the Hulk, then in this case the Hulk can be used as the light probe by learning the reflections, how the Hulk statue reflects light. Uh, and here you can see this is the physical statue, and I'm going to show you a very short video clip because this is like a material from last week, uh, where the user replaces the physical Hulk with a virtual Hulk and then illumin illuminates the virtual Hulk uh, with the real camera phone by estimating the lighting situation changes and applying it to the virtual Hulk. Okay, now we're replacing the Hulk. This is the virtual Hulk now, and now notice how the virtual Hulk is illuminated with, uh, in real time with the camera light. Yeah? So, so this is the kind of thing you can get in real time now. Um, what I haven't discussed is um, how we apply that. How do we produce the mixed reality images? Because in the end, what I've uh, just discussed is the equivalent of geometric registration, namely photometric registration, where I obtain an estimate of the lighting situation. Once I have that, um, I can apply that to a mixed reality uh, illumination computation. Um, if I define local illumination to be only the effects of direct light and global illumination to be the effects of both direct light and indirect light, so light that bounces off at least one time another surface, then, uh, my, my, then we have already discussed the direct illumination and what remains to be discussed is the indirect illumination. And uh, the indirect illumination, I mean there are many known methods for computing indirect illumination effects, but now we have to apply them to any combination of uh, either from real or from virtual to real or to virtual objects. Yeah? So we have four sub-problems of indirect illumination to solve. And uh, here's the table. From real to real is already taken care of by nature. From virtual to virtual is uh, taken care by standard computer graphics. But from real to virtual object we uh, can simply compute uh, global illumination after we know what the real object is. 
if we want to compute the effects from a virtual object to a real object, uh, that's kind of more difficult. We still have to compute the global illumination effects, but then we have to apply them with something called differential rendering. And uh, that is the following idea. If you are going to um, apply lighting changes to a mixed reality scene, then essentially what you have to do is you have to simulate the entire system of both the virtual and the real objects in, for, for this indirect illumination, for this global illumination. Yeah? That would be this picture here, the picture showing the virtual teapot and the physical cube together. Yeah? This is the input image that we get of the same scene, which of course doesn't contain the, um, the virtual teapot. Yeah? Now, there will be lighting phenomena in the real image that we cannot simulate because we don't have the data. But we do have the input image, which is a representation of the data. We have this camera image, LC, that contains or encodes some of the subtle indirect illumination transport. Um, and what we can do now is we can compute a virtual simulation of just the real object, that's the LR image here in the middle. And if we subtract that from the camera image and then add it to the um, combined image, we're basically adding these subtle effects that couldn't be modeled in the global illumination pipeline. Uh, now, of course, this, that has to be done only to the real part of the image, in this case, the video background image. Uh, whereas for the uh, virtual object foreground, we're just applying the, the information from the LR R plus V, from the top left-hand side image, the full simulation. Huh? This is the principle of differential rendering. And now for all known global illumination approaches that are used in, in, in many game engines now, we can basically do a, a differential variant uh, that incorporates this principle into the mixed reality, well, into the, into the, the lighting engine that is inside the, the game engine, for example. The simplest is probably just uh, using shadow mapping. So shadow mapping computes shadows by computing a second depth image that is more or less telling us what the light source sees, and that that information can be used as a lookup texture uh, to determine whether a surface point rendered from uh, a user's view on the left-hand side is in shadow or not. Yeah? So if, it's, uh, if this point here is actually clo uh, further away from the light source than what is encoded in the, in the shadow map, then this point would be in shadow. And we can combine that with an environment map by extracting explicit dominant light sources from the environment map, just search for the brightest spots in the, in the environment map. This is, the, this is like a cubic environment map, only with just uh, four sides here, huh? uh, like a panoramic image. Uh, and then we apply um, image-based lighting and shadows together. So we still use the environment map like we had it before, but we're also doing the shadows now uh, using conventional shadow mapping but in a differential rendering pass. Now that can lead to, to more nasty situations with double shadowing where you, are, you, know, you use two light sources and then you're making the image twice darker because it's in shadow of two light sources. That's something you don't want. So instead you should, uh, if you can afford the computational budget, rather go to a full global illumination situation. And there are, there are many methods such as pass tracing, for example, um, if you can afford a ray tracing engine, which is not what a typical game will do because it's too slow, yeah? uh, then you can simulate any kind of, of light transport, so then you get these typical ray tracing images. Few objects, but lots of mirrors in there because they can do mirrors well. And it looks fancy, and arguably it's a more complete uh, type of light transport simulation. Yeah? You can also do an approximation of that. This is what many game engines do. This is also what was done in this work. So here you only see some diffuse um, indirect light transport effects, like the reddish cheek of, of Mario or the shadow of the dragon under the bed. So if you have a dragon under the bed, it's usually in shadow. You can also do the specular uh, global light transport effects. Um, so for example, here the real hand is, reflect, is refracted in a virtual glass. And uh, 
this video is a little low resolution, but let's take a look. So the glass is virtual. And here you see the effect with the hand. And this can be done by ray tracing, but uh, um, unfortunately, yeah, look at the ring and the shadow and the caustics on the ring. Unfortunately, these kind of things uh, get relatively expensive. Um, so, but with advanced, I mean, this is not the problem as such of the mixed reality rendering. It just adds a constant overhead to the whole thing. Uh, it's more a question of if a game engine can do these effects, then you can theoretically also do it in a mixed reality rendering uh, if you can afford a little more computational budget. But uh, if you want to do these fancy effects, in particular the specularities, you will need a very precise registration because otherwise the rays of whatever you're using will just bounce off in the wrong direction and produce garbage. Yeah? Um, Is it realistic to expect ray tracing? You have to be always careful. The, the solutions are in the end often hybrid. Yeah? And if you look at what games do today, they are incorporating global illumination effects partially based on ray tracing, but very carefully designed to not uh, blow up your computational budget. Uh, for example, they use uh, a smaller number of rays. Yeah? Um, they, they, they limit the length of the ray in the scene. Uh, and. Uh, they do only allow, let's say, one ray bounce, but not two or three, uh, and all of that. And they only do it for selected objects, like your avatar in the shiny armor has ray tracing effects, but then the, the minions don't have any ray tracing effects because they're not worthy of it. Um, and uh, with that, they get to some fairly nice uh, results. And similar things could be used in mixed reality as well. Um, so when the games get to the point where they do that in virtual reality, then basically you can also do it in, in, in mixed reality uh, with the caveat that you have now more factors that you need to bring together. Like if your tracking quality is not super accurate, then it may, may destroy some of the effects. And then the question is, is it, is it worth it to, to try that kind of thing? But it's not a problem in principle. And it's, again, it's not like the, you don't have to use ray tracing. There are other ways of doing it. Uh, um, but it's mostly a question of how um, fancy you want these effects to go. Basic effects can be done relatively cheaply. Um, and then selected effects can be more costly. Um, yeah, so my final item is diminished reality. This is kind of going into the opposite direction. If we can change everything, we can also make objects disappear. Yeah? In order to do that, we have to first determine the object that we want to disappear in the scene. I mean, kind of assuming that this is uh, not known in the beginning. For example, through tracking. We're tracking an object that we want to disappear. Then we observe uh, or model the hidden area behind the region of interest or object of interest and then we put the new content there uh, where we have to uh, find the right kind of, um, of information. And um, OK, so let's say we know the region of interest already because the user indicated it or because it has been detected and then segmented or uh, defined through some other means. Uh, then we can either have a reconstruction of the hidden area or we can hypothesize or fantasize the, the, the hidden information. And that's usually done by in-painting, you know, by taking some similar regions in the visible scene and duplicating them in a clever way. And I'll just show you a few examples of, of what can be done here. So here, they wanted to make this uh, haptic uh, feedback arm disappear to make the user to give the user an impression that they're operating with this, uh, with this wrench directly. Yeah? And they did that by building an an, a, a background environment and then um, tracking the camera, uh, tracking the, the object that they want to disappear, uh, sort of enclosing it in this green area and replacing all the pixels in the green area with, uh, with what is seen 
uh, in the background model. That is, of course, only working if you have a static background model and will typically not take any of these shadow or, or global illumination effects into account. Huh? Here's another thing that is a little more swift because this required a careful reconstruction of the environment uh, beforehand. Uh, here's a little experiment that, uh, that we did a while back. Um, so this is just running a SLAM system and now we're placing an object here. Um, and now we're making the object disappear. And if you look very carefully, you can see some errors and, and jumps. And that tells you that this was actually impainted from the texture maps that we had obtained. Basically, we've used the keyframes from the SLAM system as texture maps on, uh, uh, on, the, on the course reconstruction. And even though it's very coarse, you can create the illusion that uh, you are hiding the object. Yeah? Um, if you don't have the luxury of taking any um, type, even a spontaneous reconstruction into account, then you can guess. So for example, you could guess by synthesizing more texture, more of the same what is in the environment. Uh, here you see how this works for hardwood floors or for, for carpets to, to a limited degree. Um, there's even more complicated methods that try to find um, patches in the environment that uh, that uh, resemble the, the local structure at the boundary and then basically texture snippets are filled in uh, by copying them over and modifying them slightly. And that can produce fairly impressive results. I mean, that's a technique that Photoshop has as well, but uh, now it can also be done in real time. Uh, and you get nice results, but only as long as there's no semantically important information uh, in, because you would not want to copy something over, like let's say you want to make the fork disappear and there's a knife also in the picture and suddenly the system copies parts of the knife over the fork because they happen to match on the pixel level, then that would not be a good idea. Yeah? So if you can bring in some, some knowledge, this comes down again to object detection and scene understanding. If you can interpret the scene, you can produce more plausible results there. Um, or you could project over things if you, uh, if you use these retroreflective materials uh, and you have a projector, then you can make objects almost disappear or at least appear extremely translucent in a, in a nice way. And there have been experiments of people wearing a retroreflective raincoat and having a camera mounted on their back and then projecting what the camera sees on top of them and suddenly people seem to be translucent. Uh, so that's a magic trick that you can do there on the stage. Um, and finally, um, mediated reality, that would be a technique where not only are you removing an object, uh, but then also uh, put another object in the same place. And I'll just show you a little video clip of doing that. So here's the fruit scene that we've seen beforehand. Um, this is the real video from a Kinect. And, uh, this is the kind of reconstruction that you get uh, here, um, which is then segmented into individual materials like the orange fruit or the, yeah, uh, the green pepper. Um, and from that we can get the, the incident lighting. So we can basically remove the lighting from the scene and get the lighting effects and also the, the specular reflections as a separate uh, result. And now we can synthesize virtual fruits from any angle and with any kind of illumination. And let me jump ahead a little bit. Here again is the real fruits. And now you go, you're going to see um, a simple form of mediated reality already where we are replacing the real fruits with the virtual fruits <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, and if you see no change, then we've basically won because uh, you shouldn't be able to spot any difference. But the question, of course, is can you also produce a new scene? So now we're going to add a virtual object here, in this case, the white ball. Um, and uh, yes, it is consistently illuminated uh, in, this, in this real environment. And now you see a real mediated uh, reality scene where we have removed the fruits and replaced them with an entirely different object. And you can still see how the dragon is illuminated by the desk lamp and by the, even by the bluish monitor to some degree. And uh, all of that works uh, in real time. Okay. 
Oh, uh, that was a laptop, computer, a powerful laptop, and the Kinect. Yeah. So this is hardware that should run on mobile in maybe not this year, but in three years. Yeah. And uh, um, it, it required a, a Kinect, so it required a depth sensor to produce the input results. Um, and uh, it has a pre-computation of about one minute or so on the laptop. After, after the scanning, yeah, you do one-time scanning, then you run the analysis to compute the, the albedo and, and incident lighting, um, and then you can run it with, I guess it was 30 hertz or something like that. If you camera like real sense, then you would not need the connect. Oh yes, you need, you, no, no, you need the scanning phase and the computation phase because you need to produce an accurate reconstruction from the scanning. Huh? If, you, the, the, if you use the live depth images, they are too noisy. Even if you filter them, they won't give you that kind of result. And also there's a global illumination simulation going on. So if you only capture a portion of the scene from one uh, direction, then you cannot get uh, the light transport on the backside because you've never seen it. And therefore you need to produce some kind of reasonable scan and run some uh, optimization for uh, a short amount of time. Uh, in order to, to get these results, but it's relatively lightweight. So, can okay, I also use uh, Action Pro 3D Desk Camera can do this with this Kinect? Well, as I said, I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. We use the Kinect as input. Can I also use Action Pro 3D Desk Camera? Yeah, the, 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 the Action, the, the Asus Action is more or less the same hardware. Any, it doesn't matter, you just need a, a, a depth image stream to begin with. Yeah, so that's the, the Lenovo, I mean, we haven't tried it, but you, you surely know the Tango phone, the Lenovo Fab 2 Pro, with this would be sufficient hardware for doing this kind of thing. Maybe, I mean, again, I didn't do the tests, but I would say that the hardware you used was maybe twice as fast as the Lenovo phone or something like that. And the Kinect V1 is probably worse than what is on the Lenovo. <laughs> I don't really know. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so in order to still have some coffee break, we can maybe squeeze in one or two questions and then move on. So in case you're interested, I think all of these things can be embedded into Unity or your arbitrary development platform, but nobody has done so yet. You know, these are all prototypes, uh, and they're all... Can you do more on that? How do you do that? Hmm? How do you embed that on Unity? Well, I mean, there's, there's some software modules like the reconstruction, the rendering methods, which are customized, and they would have to be made plugins for, for, for something like Unity in order to be, to be productive. There, there's still the problem that you can't let, let the end users do the, the environment scanning themselves. They will not manage to do that simply because they don't understand what, if you tell them cover the entire scene with images, it doesn't work. <laughs> so that, that's gonna be a little bit of a showstopper. I believe something like uh, the learned light probes that I've showed you, you buy a toy, you unpack it and uh, it comes with an app, and the app has already the content that is physically present somehow integrated. This might be the, the most clever approach for using this kind of, of uh, situation. Quick coffee break, and then... Uh... Okay, I guess you all want a coffee break, so we'll make 15 minutes coffee break. Uh, until 4.30, yeah. Good, thank you.